Hebrews chapter 10, and we'll begin reading at verse 23. Stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word. The Bible says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Father, I pray you bless our time together for we make our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I want you to hear the theme of what's taking place in particular in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Judaism is the religion of the day in the land of our dear Lord, the land of Israel. And yet, Christ has come on the scene. God incarnate. God manifesting himself through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah. And as a result, not only did Jesus preach this message in John the Baptist, but now even through the conversion of men like the Apostle Paul, Simon Peter and others, they're preaching Christ. And to those who are Jews, they're being encouraged to realize that all that they've seen has been a shadow of that which is to come, but they can now move from the shadow of things to come to the substance of life in the person of God's Son. And so as a result, there is a conversion, and people are embracing Jesus Christ as their Messiah. But yet there's the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and other religious leaders, and they're encouraging them, don't trust Christ. And they're questioning whether he is indeed God. And they're encouraging them to hold on, listen to this, to their dead religion. And as many embrace Christ, then some of the people are still putting pressure on them, come back. So with that in mind, I want to begin this morning by talking to you about the confession of our worship. The confession. We hold a confession. If you were to say to me this morning, Johnny Hunt, what is your confession? Here it is. January the 7th, 1973, 20 years old, managing a pool room. No religion at all. No one in my family went to church. And then someone pleaded with me to be their guest at a church service and an evangelical church where the Bible and the gospel was preached. I went and heard that message. The message was alarming, yet it rang true in my heart. And I was told that if I would repent of my sins, acknowledge that I had sinned against God, and that if I would by faith invite God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into my life, Jesus would change my life. It was a faith adventure to trust Him. My wife will tell you that after that morning service, normally we fired up my old red GTO and headed to Holly Ridge Drag Strip, but not that day. I said, I'm going back to church tonight, that night. Was that significant? Well, if you've never been to Sunday night church, it's significant. If you've never been to Bible study class, it's significant. If you've never owned a Bible, it's significant. But we went back that night, and that night, at the close of that service, when there was an invitation given to receive Christ, I made what I believe is the single most important decision of my life. I asked Jesus Christ to cleanse me of my sin, to come into my life and be my personal savior and he saved me and my wife came down the aisle and trusted Christ a few years earlier than I did and so they said we are going to call you to New Testament obedience you need to be baptized baptism is an outward sign of an inward change here's what baptism does when I stood in that pool I was not opening my mouth but I was identifying with everyone else there that I had come to publicly, unashamedly identify with God's Son, the Lord Jesus. In just a few moments, Emmy Gibson placed Janet and I under the water, which symbolized the death that we identified with in Jesus Christ. We were giving our confession. We were confessing we believe he died. We believe he was buried, but thank God they didn't leave me under the water. In just a moment, they brought me up, and I was making another confession. I believe Jesus not only came in this world and died for my sins and was buried, but I believe on the third day, he got up from the dead. Ladies and gentlemen, baptism is a Christian's confession of faith. Now, he's telling us to hold on to our confession of hope. What is that hope? That hope is not only what God did in this life, but I want you to know that when this life is over, the Bible teaches 
that I can be as assured of heaven as though I were already there. Now, giving you that background from not only the first century, but also what took place in my life in the 20th century, let's look at the confession of our worship. The Bible says we're to hold on to this confession without wavering. The Bible says let us hold fast, that is have a grip on it, hold it tight, the confession of our hope without wavering. Here's what he's saying. You Jews that have trusted Jesus Christ and came out of Judaism, we have some in our church that are Jews. You could refer to yourself as complete Jews. You refer to yourself as messianic Jews. He's saying now that you've held on to Jesus Christ, don't waver. Don't bend. Don't go back. And let me stand flat-footed this morning and say something very clear as well. We're not just talking about Jews. We're living in the 21st century where there's a lot of men and women, Gentiles, that have professed to trust Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. The Bible says don't go back. The Bible says don't waver. Don't bend. Stay true to your testimony in Jesus Christ. I believe one of the greatest testaments that Jesus Christ died and rose from the dead is a changed life believer and so he's saying I don't want you to go back no bending no leaning stand with firmness it literally means in the Greek language don't lie down uh, not to lean back to the old life but rather move forward he's calling us to press on here's what he's saying beware of the pull beware of the pull of the old life once you come to faith in Jesus Christ it doesn't mean there's not still a pull back there from the old life trying to drag you back in to where you came from so the basic appeal of this text is the faithfulness of God so regardless of what may come your way the believer is encouraged in this text to stand firm in the confession of their hope in Jesus Christ my hope are y'all listening my hope is based on my confession in Jesus Christ if someone were to say, why do you believe when this life is over, you'll spend eternity with Christ? Because of my confession in Jesus Christ as my hope. And by the way, you can hold fast when you are genuinely hopeful. It speaks of perseverance. Not holding fast our salvation, but holding fast our hope. See, I'm holding on to hope, but salvation's holding on to me. And so you don't have to hold that Christ holds you and by the way it's a present tense verb which means keep on holding you know what the Christian life calls for it calls for a continual life of persevering it's an eternal vigilance but let me go a step further he says I want you to hold on to the confession of our worship without wavering but also without doubting the Bible says in verse number 23 for he is faithful who promised for he who promised is faithful. Now, I want to read a text that Jesus gave us, and I want to see if what Jesus Christ said in the first century has relevance to the 21st century. So listen carefully. In John chapter 12 and verse 42, the Bible says, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. Now, do you realize what's happening? Religious rulers in the first century were leaving Judaism and embracing Jesus Christ. It says, But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue now someone may say to me now pastor johnny don't you think that's the right thing to do now let's let the bible answer for a moment don't you think that's the right thing to do i mean here they are they're jews let the word get out that they've trusted jesus christ it could endanger their life it could endanger the life of their family how does jesus feel about that how would jesus christ speak into this issue that they would not confess him that is, they're not willing to go public with their commitment that unashamedly, count me in. My colors are clear. I've crossed the line. I've trusted God's Son as my personal Lord and Savior. The Bible says, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, here's the words of Jesus, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Ladies and gentlemen, there comes a time in your life that if Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior, you should not be ashamed before anyone that he is your savior it doesn't matter where you are if you're embarrassed of jesus christ there's real question of whether you really know him or not and so it doesn't matter whether there's a pharisee there there's a president there there's a sanhedrin that's there when i preach at the senate when i preach for the representatives when i preach to congress i have one name to lift high 
That is the name of God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't bend back. Don't waver. Preach Jesus. That's what he's telling them to do. That's the context of this passage. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. God cannot deny himself. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24 says, he who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Now, did you know there's a human side of perseverance and there's the divine side of perseverance? We don't do anything to keep ourselves saved. But it is evident on the human side that when we do persevere we are saved let me go a step further there's a confession of our worship so I'm, I'm here as a God worshiper this morning but ladies and gentlemen look at me carefully I need to not only be able to worship him here I'm to be a worshiper everywhere and if you push back you lay down you bend you waver somewhere you're not being faithful to the one who calls you. If he went to such extremes for me, God helped me to be faithful to him. Let me go a step further. Let me talk to you about the consideration of our worship. The Bible says in verse 24, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Now, we're still in the context of worship. That means to fix our eyes upon, focus your attention on other believers. Present tense, keep on doing so. So look here, look at me. I came to church today, and I've come, Howard, to worship Jesus. But as I come into his presence, and I believe as we come into his presence and really get to know him, he changes us. And as he does, you know what we do? We touch others. We're considering others. I'm focusing my attention. I begin to think not only do I love Jesus and I want to worship him. And by the way, the reason he gets us to look to one another is he has no needs. He has no needs. You're just there to acclaim who he is and to give him praise and worship for that. So the writer of Hebrews begins with a call to consider one another. But you know where it started? We start by considering him. Once we consider Christ, then we consider others. Listen to the DNA of Woodstock in this text. Hebrews 3.1, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2 and 3, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and discouraged in your, in your soul. So what we do, we consider him. So what do we do? We came in worship. Do you notice that the songs that we sang were about him? I will remember. What are you going to remember? You're going to remember today that Jesus Christ saved you going to remember the, the darkest day of your life when Jesus Christ carried you. We're there to consider him. Now we're encouraged to consider one another. So where are we moving? Worship God, love others. It's the proper order in which we derive our church's DNA. This reminds us that we are justified. God makes us right with Christ. But we are sanctified in relation to other Christians. Listen to this. When the Bible uses that word sanctified, it's where we derive our word holy, Sanctified means that when God saved you, he set you aside for himself. Now, listen carefully. If he set you, Clint, aside for himself, and he set me aside for himself, you know what we got in common? There's a Greek New Testament word, koinonia, fellowship, partnership, communion, commonality. We have things in common. We are in it together, and so we're to consider him, and then we're to consider one another. I believe uh, John Piper said it best when he said, we do missions because all don't worship. We do missions because all don't worship. If everyone could worship God, which would mean everyone would have a relationship with Jesus Christ, there'd be no need for mission. I wouldn't have a mission this morning other than to just worship God. So we're speaking of a re reciprocal relationships. It speaks of the intimacy of the community of the faith. Now, what am I to consider about you? Now, I want you to hear this. I'm here this morning, and I wish this room, I could just shrink it and bring everybody to the front row for a moment so I could look you in the eyeball and say this. But listen to this. Orchestra and choir, I want you to hear me. I'm getting ready to say something as clear as I can that really refers to why we come together in corporate worship. And by the way, it is talking about when it says, let us draw near, that's private worship. 
But when it says not forsaking ourselves together, assembling together, that is corporate worship. So I'm going to show you what the Bible says. We're living in a day where everybody's sharing what they think the church ought to do. Well, there's only one thing wrong with that. We got a, a, a blueprint, a guide uh, to lead us and direct us as a church. Now, here's what my duty is to do, and I need to share something with you. This is going to come as a surprise to some of you. You have the same duty. The Bible says, first of all, Johnny, when you get everybody together, let people use their gifts to stir up devotion. Do you see it in verse number 24? It says, when you come together, considering one another, let us stir up love. Stir up love. That means to sharpen, to incite, to stimulate. Now, sometimes people say about me, they say, you, you're kind of passionate in your preaching. Would you not agree that it's kind of hard to stimulate with boredom? Can you imagine a coach trying to get a team fired up and say, okay, coach, um, we need to really get a big win today. No, he gets them in the locker room, and he reminds me of that sergeant before his privates. He's red in his face, and he's telling them it's going to be dangerous out on that field. And he gets right there, and he gets right in their face. Do you hear me, private? Yes, sir, sergeant. And I don't know why y'all don't respond to me like that. But anyway, uh, the Bible says in Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Here's what he's saying about our church and about the church of Jesus Christ. We're to be loving. We're to be a loving church. The bigger we get, the smaller we must become. He's telling them that others will be challenged by their love, loving example. He's encouraging the love loud event. Love will be the action and attitude toward other believers. Now, do you see the DNA once again? Worship God, love your neighbor. So I've come together this morning. I would like to think that those of you, I've had the privilege to be here 23 years, that have sat under our ministry for all these years. Some of you have been with me the whole time. I'd like to think that I've stirred your devotion some. I'd like, I'd like to believe. Don't tell me if I haven't. That I've stirred up your love for Christ some. Number two, stir up others to demonstrate their devotion. He says, stir up love. Did you see it in verse 24? He says, stir up good works. That continues to magnify our DNA. What is it? We worship God, we love others, and we serve God. We serve God by good works, by service. Again, actions speak louder than words. Here's what he's saying. Be a stimulator to others by your life's testimony and demonstrating your devotion to Jesus Christ, your witness and service. This is the church's stimulus package. This speaks of a faithful service. Good works will be the action toward the needs of other believers as a demonstration of that love. So here it is. What do we do? Why did we come together today? We came to worship God and to consider one another. Now, let me move to a third statement and spend these last few minutes with it. All right, we've talked about holding on to the confession of our hope. Don't bend back. Now, here's what it means. Uh, don't slide back toward where you came from. Every one of us can think of someone that could be in an empty seat this morning that used to seemingly love Jesus, but they've, they've leaned, they're leaning back, Alan. They're, they're, they've gone back. They, they're deserters. That's what the word, word refers to. They've deserted. Uh, they've forsaken. So with that in mind, he says, but instead, come together and uh, stir up love and stir up good works. But then, let me, let me do this. Let me talk to you about the coming together of our worship. We're in a, in a generation today, someone says, well, I don't have to go to church to worship God. Now, I want you to listen to me carefully. I have a Bible in hand. You may say, I don't have to go to church to worship. And you don't. You can worship God at home. But I want you to hear me. Based on your Bible, you're supposed to come together to worship. You know what I've found? Without exception, in my 36 years of knowing Jesus Christ, I've never known a Christian that could burn bright for God's son outside the context of corporate worship. Never, never. But now I have a Bible that supports that. So we're not just talking about what Johnny Hunt thinks. Listen to this, verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Negatively, not forsaking. Positively, but exhorting. I'm going to give you four words and I'm through. The first word is the word, the message. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. The word assembling is an interesting word. It's only used two times in your Bible. It's used when we come together to worship, 
And it's also used for the day that Jesus Christ will come back in the clouds and will assemble the church together for us to be gathered with him. Can I ask you a question? Is anyone in this room that believes that when Jesus Christ returns and assembles the church to take it to heaven, anybody here doubt that that will be exciting? Well, if the word's only used twice, if it's going to be exciting going up, don't you think it ought to be a little exciting down here as well? I mean, I'd hate to know that I'm part of a dead church waiting for a living Savior. It just don't ring true somehow in, in, my, in my thinking. So in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1, the Bible says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together. So I think both are to be exciting. But he says, don't forsake the assembling. That means to abandon spiritual deserters. They belong, but they no longer come. The, the Bible speaks to that. Well, I, don't, I don't think I have to go to church. Uh, it's almost like he's reminding us, don't criticize your church. Love it, support it, and do good works in the context of the body of Christ. And if you can't do that where you are, go join when you can. So why come together? We come together to love one another and to do good works together that the world may see our good works, Matthew 5, 16, Jesus speaking, and glorify our God in heaven. So when Jesus Christ comes, I don't wish for him to find me slacking off, but stirring others up. Now, let me give you the word, the manner. He says, as is the manner of some. I don't have to go to church if I don't want to. I can hear that teenager telling their mother that this morning. No, you don't, but you're supposed to. You don't have to tithe, but you're supposed to. So the text refers to not leaving the things behind, but instead being active in them. 2 Timothy 4.10. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica. Ladies and gentlemen, that name could be replaced with countless of millions of other names that at one time were Christ's followers, and for some reason they backed off. Now, let me just speculate. Pastor, why do you think some backed off? A great number of them backed off because they were never truly saved. They profess something with their lips that they never possessed in their heart, a relationship with Jesus Christ. Some have been influenced before they got grounded by others that have helped pull them away. And then some have not matured to the point to know that the Christian life is not a playground, it's a battleground. And when the battle came and got intense, they thought, this is not fair. And so they pulled away. Now, he talks about the ministry. Well, what am I ought to do? If I'm, if I'm not to forsake and I'm to be there, and, and the manner of some is they have forsaken, what am I doing? He said, but you come on together in the assembly, gather together, and exhort one another. The Bible says, use this gift so much the more as you see the day approaching. This ought to pose this question. What day? Let's talk for a moment. We've got Bible in hand. Unless all of your belief systems based on your philosophy of life instead of the inerrant truth of the absolute moral truth of God's Word. What day? Well, when this book was written, Hebrews, it was around 60 A.D. Could it be that the writer of Hebrews saw what was getting ready to happen in Jerusalem? Rome was going to march against them. Uh, they would be millions of Jews slaughtered. The temple would be destroyed. That's in history. That's not just Bible history. That is in human history in 70 A.D. Titus led a legion into uh, Jerusalem and then outside of Jerusalem, and many, many were slaughtered. Uh, the Bible in Romans 13, verses 11 through 14, make note of it. I don't have time to deal with it, but it says the day is far spent. Uh, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. What day? Some say, well, maybe he's referring to the day of um, the Roman legions coming in under Titus. We don't think so. Normally, when the Bible uses with a capital D the word day, the primary reference is, coming, is the coming of the Lord. When is the coming of the Lord? I don't know. The Bible just says it's closer than the day we believed. So what is he trying to tell us? He's telling us we need each other. We need to be in fellowship with the Lord and with each other. We need to be mutually strengthened e each other. We need to encourage each other. The early church in the first century lived with expectation and anticipation. Listen to Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ was offered once 
to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. The Bible teaches that Jesus Christ that established the church at Pentecost went to the Mount of Olives and ascended back to heaven that the Bible teaches coming back to that same mount. And so the Bible says you ought to be encouraging one another, spurring one another on, stimulating others because the day's approaching. In other words, we ought to be thinking that it's night, it's getting darker in America and the day comes when no man can work because Christ is coming and this ought to be the motivation. Have you ever felt a motivation in your heart to say this? My daddy's not a Christian. Well, what are you waiting on? Christ to come? Believing that Christ is coming ought to spur you on to love your father enough to tell him the good news. And if you don't love him enough to tell him the good news, pray in Jesus' name, who does? And so we ought to tell him. 1 John 3, 1 through 3 says this, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now are we the children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, that is he's coming back, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as God is pure. In other words, your motives ought to become pure. You ought to really want to make a difference for Jesus Christ. Look at me, and I love you, and my duty is to come and to stir you to devotion and to good works and to witness and to serve God and to give to the cause that the nations may know God's Son. And so I pray that you would, would allow the DNA of the New Testament to become your DNA so that you'd become a God worshiper a lover of others, one who wants to serve God and one that invites others to join them in the context of the family. Heavenly Father, speak into our hearts in this invitation time. For Jesus' sake, amen.